What's up, Hot Take Nation? DRW here. Uh, glad to be back, and I'm really excited to be joined by a uh, a very unique individual when it comes to Denver Oil and Gas. Joe Dominic, thank you for joining us. How are you? Very good today. Thank you guys for coming by. Great. So uh, for those who don't know Joe, uh, Joe and I have actually probably gone back since you got to Anschutz. So we've known each other for, for six years. We I haven't had a meeting with you in this conference room before, but... Um, one of our first meetings was to talk about the Powder River Basin, yes. and uh, you guys are a huge player up there. I'd love for you to just set the stage and give us some some stats on what it is you're doing up there, how many rigs, how many acres, what you're seeing, and then let's dive into the Powder River Basin. You bet. Yeah, no, we uh, have uh, continued to grow that position since we first met six years ago. So the company actually, you know, had been a player in the Powder River Basin for decades. Mr. Anschutz had been there drilling vertical wells back when the conventional plays were ongoing. Um, but the, the recent activity in our, our efforts to get into the basin really start, kicked off in uh, late 13, uh, very fourth quarter uh, with, a, with an acquisition of WPX's deep rights. Um, and then since then, we've discontinued to, and kind of my wording, but we continue to pile on. Uh, we're currently uh, right around 500,000 net acres wow. across, the, across the basin yeah. uh, right now. Uh, good good portion of its HPP, around 65, 66% HPP. Uh, so we don't have a lot of um, near-term pressures to drill wells. We've got some runway. Uh, and then a lot of the leases, uh, some of the newer federal leases we've picked up, you know, have 10-year terms. So again, um, you know, we've got, we've got time. We can go at our pace. We can make smart decisions about where we drill, what we drill. Uh, we have very few or none, uh, zero uh, continuous drilling clauses. It's not a, something that's uh, in the leases up, up yeah. there compared to Gulf Coast right. or Texas. And, and so. you know, when you think about, yeah, there's so many questions to lead off with. So 500,000 acres is, is immense. If you were to think about the entire play area of the Powder River Basin, I mean, are you guys like 25% of the play or how, how many acres is the Powder River Basin in terms of what you would consider perspective and relative to your competition, how big are you relative to who your competitors are? Yeah, good questions. Uh, I mean, the first one really, uh, how much do does Anschutz control over the over the play area? I act, we haven't actually calculated that. That's something we we probably should do. Um, I, I would say that I don't almost don't want to hazard a guess, but it's we have a very small position in comparison to the whole play. Okay. The play really covers really most of Converse County, the better part of Campbell Johnson. If you're familiar with those counties, and those yeah. are these are Rockies, you know, Western U.S. counties. These are big counties. Yeah, uh, I don't know how how big those are, but and so big. so EOG EOG is there. Mm -hmm. Would they would they be the biggest and most active player up there? How would you rank the activity levels and, and number of rigs running? Yeah, so the last uh, numbers we looked at was late, late last year, and we kind of look at it from uh, a standpoint on uh, acreage totals and then just rig activity and drilling activity. So. From an acreage standpoint, um, we're either number one or EOG is number one with Oxy a close number three. Uh, those would be the top three players in, in, in the basin right now. Um, as far as rig activity, uh, we've been running two rigs. We were at three late last year, but we're running two now. We're going to stay flat at two. Uh, EOG has been one to four. Uh, I think they're average around two, two and a half. Uh, Chesapeake had five at one point, five right. to six. They're down to three, what I understand. Yeah. And Devon was up temporarily, I think, to five for a, sh a month or two. And they're targeting, I think, three from what I'd heard. And then Oxy's at one. And then everyone else, all the private equity, all the other private companies, they bounce around from a couple wells to zero. Right. So we're the, we're, us and the four publics are really the, the active players in the basin. And so starting in 2013, the thing that got you in and got you to join Anschutz to really lead this effort, how have you seen the Powder River develop in terms of, you know, I think a lot of people talk about the Turner and, and the Turner's been the bread and butter kind of, and, and as the play has evolved, moved more to Maori Niobrara. Talk to me about the evolution, the changes in technology and how how you've seen things change over the six years with, with everything that's gone on. Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, if we step back, um, the powder and how we look at it, you know, the powder is a very oil-rich basin. Uh, a ton of conventional uh, production over decades 
Um, and if you look, we pulled the data early on back six years ago, we we're looking at different areas. The powders produced over 3 billion barrels of hydrocarbons from conventional reservoirs. So vertical wells, no fracks, no, high, no horizontal wells, none of that fancy stuff, right? Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendous resource to begin with. Um, and so the early horizontal, the early testing, some of the first things that were done by Ballard or EOG was really looking for those halo plays or those offsets to uh, the conventional that maybe didn't produce economic rates, but apply new tech technology to, to extract those hydrocarbons. And then I think the basin slowly, compared to a lot of basins, has has continued to evolve and grow from there. So people have stepped out from that, initially looking for the tight sandstones, Peapot, Parkman, Sussex, Turner, Frontier, have been those main groupings of those tight sandstones, poked around, discovered those areas, found some really good wells because the rates are so high. Um, and then now what's been happening over the past 18 months, plus or minus, there's a shift, a, a substantial shift to the Niobrara and then some some Maori testing, uh, but the Niobrara is really the next zone that everyone's targeting. Ourselves, EOG, Devon are, are some of the leading players targeting the Niobrara, and there's some interesting results coming out of that. So, so talk to me about some of those results, because what it sounds like for, for listeners who might not be that familiar with the Powder River Basin is it's really been a tight sand play, and that, that you know, and obviously there's sort of spacing. What would you say two, is two wells in those sands, kind of two wells per 640, the right-ish number as you think about a tight sand versus a shale? Well, a couple things. So first off, what happened early on, there was in, in ourselves, Manchutes, we did this as well. We drilled the shorter laterals, the 4,500 foot lateral length, 640 DSUs early on, kind of got our feet wet, so to speak, got going. Once we figured that out, it to this day, pretty much everyone drills long laterals, the 1280 DSUs. Yeah. So the basin's largely spaced out. There's some stranded or scattered or isolated 640 still remaining, but everyone's doing longs at this point. Um, the, those spacings on the tight sandstones, there was a, um, a pretty sizable development going on early in the Parkman three or four years ago, and EOG and Devon were the leaders in that. They were spaced at four uh, wells per 1280 DSU okay. um, and economics look good because those wells are so cheap. I mean, they were drilling, we were in Devon wells that were 4.8 million drilling complete and equipped. Uh, so very economic, high rate wells, quick return on your investment, those type of things. Um, and what we've seen evolve is Turner and Frontier, as you move, as you move deeper in the section, you know, costs are, are slightly higher. Um, we, we, we lean to Anschutz, we lean to the more aggressive side rather than the conservative side. So uh, late um, 17, we drilled three DSUs at four wells, four turn wells per DSU. Um, we did sizable fracks on those. And in in the results, in hindsight, we over drilled it or over fracked it, however, mm -hmm. you, however you look upon that. Uh, since that time, we've studied that. We've studied the offset, Devon, Oxy, and EOG are drilling three wells, Chesapeake's drilling two, the other public. Um, we've landed on two just because some of the variability with the sandstones. Right. Uh, it's a capital risk reward decision. Um, we think we can get you know the bulk of the reserves and better economics drilling two than drilling three. And so do you bias when you only drill two versus three? Are your fracks generally bigger than the offset guys that are doing three or how, you know, obviously industry is str struggling with this right now. It's not just a well spacing question. It's a well spacing plus a frac design. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you guys, what's your secret sauce in terms of how you compare to your offsets around frac design and spacing? Yeah, if you look at the data, uh, the, the completions data on the designs and sizes of the, of the completions in the powder, you'll find that Anschutz is on the smaller side. Um, we, we, Generally, our philosophy is initial wells go big, I mean, we pump ceramic actually on those wells rather than sand, mm -hmm. just to eliminate that question about prop crushing and X, Y, Z on those things. Um, and then we scale back o almost immediately from there once we know it's economic. Um, we've seen recently uh, some wells we're in with, with other operators at, you know, again, talking about the Turner, uh, three well spacing, their, their completions were similar to our single parent well completions. 
um, which the data shows they're they're pretty much fracking across their whole 1280 with those three wells. They're all communicating. Right. It seems a little excessive to us from a capital standpoint. It doesn't seem as efficient, but you know, different companies look for different type of financial uh, decisions around that, and maybe maybe they feel like they're getting the reserves out at an accelerated pace. Um, ours. Our philosophy is once we understand the economics around it is try to scale accordingly. And now really a big driver is given the margins and give where all prices are is to get our costs as low as humanly possible, if you will. Right. So, uh, so, so ceramic so, just on the first wells and then mm -hmm. pivot away from that. And that's what we've done. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's actually a really good segue uh, to talk about Anschutz. I mean, one of the things I imagine that people who work here are really excited about is that every day that they open the computer, they don't see their stock price fall. And so there's no real mark to market. Um, and, and you have a very different long patient capital. Mr. Anschutz has been in here for 50 years. Fi almost, right. Yeah. Um, so talk about the strategy for Anschutz in terms of how you, how you select when you enter a basin to be the consolidator, how big, what's the right number. When you leave a basin and things that you've done, I know you were in the Bakken at, at one point, um, and and you exited there. I think you sold to Oxy, if I if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you make those decisions, and what what is the long term or overarching strategy for Anschutz with everything you guys do? How do you make your decisions? Uh, well, there's no no clear cut clear cut answer to that. It's really a return on the investment. If you if you want to think about it, it's almost like a private equity, but without the the board, the all the investors in a short time frame, <laughs> uh, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but um, all the all the bad things gone, but the good things still still stay there, I guess. Right. Um, but you know, we we look at it. So a couple things. So to us, and, and a lot of companies say this, but you know, the, the subsurface, the rocks are are the most important thing. Uh, finding the right places, buying the right leases to do that. So um, back in. 15 when you know when prices dropped we 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 restructured the company we were spread around uh the united states we had projects in texas and new york and canada and ohio and india all over the place and we cleaned up the portfolio and said we really need wanted to focus on the rockies we rebuilt our subsurface team uh, hired a number of of good geologists petrophysicists geophysicists uh reservoir engineers to really start the the underlying work to uh, form the basis of where we focus our efforts. So that's number one. Uh, number two, from a land side, uh, we have a f fairly small but uh, very effective land team, which we then have, have built that out a little bit more as well. Um, but our, our, our view as a company is we'll take some risk early on because we've done the subsurface work. Mm -hmm. We we try to limit our investments early on because it's you know, obviously a risk business, um, but we like big positions. Um, we don't have a target, but I would say if we can't get 100 or 200,000 acres on a, on a play, that's kind of small for us if it's below that number. And is, is so. 500,000 big enough? I mean, one of the things I think about with the Powder River Basin, and it's probably similar to the DJ in this, is that there really aren't a lot of players and so you don't see a lot, you know, unlike maybe the, the Midland and Delaware, where there's a lot of fractured positions and sort of there's this big consolidation wave to go from 10,000 acres to 20,000 acres to 40, you're at 500,000. Do you want to get, I mean, if, if you could be a million acres, is, is that some, is that a, the right number or it's just all opportunistic? It, it, yeah, I'd say it's all opportunistic. It's really, there's not a, not an, I mean, we don't have a hard number. Again, if it's 100 to 200, let's say the play is big enough to, to warrant us drilling wells or making further investments. Uh, we do have plays, a few plays, they're smaller than that, but we're not, we don't spend a lot of time on them because we don't think they have the scale or um, ability to really move the company where where we need to move to. Um, I would say if we wanted to double the size of the powder, we'd have to say, we have to look at it and say, does it make us a better company? Is it is it worth the investment? And can we effectively manage it uh, before we, we would go forward? We're not looking for size, it's for size, right. um, obviously, right? Um, but, but, you know, we look at it as saying, are we, are we growing or increasing the value, the underlying asset value of the company by these acquisitions, by this leasing effort, by putting our resources to bear on these plays, whether again on the subsurface side or the operational side or 
or whatever we're doing. So before we pivot to talk a little bit about your background and how you ended up here and some of the different experiences, in particular working for a private company that has no board and, and just is a very different structure, to take stock for me in where the industry is today and, and what you sort of see as, you know, any evolving technology technology that's going to make a big difference in the powder river or do you think that at this point it's lower costs and just execute and that we we sort of know the answer maybe except for the niobrara perhaps but what do you what do you see about technology and and the state of the industry in particular in the powder that that concerns you or or that you're really excited about right now so i think the the powder again like a lot of if you go back and study the williston basin the eagleford you know, some of these other, Barnett for that matter, right? Some of these plays and how DJ, how they evolved, right? I mean, you had a number of players, they come in, they drill all these ideas, these different areas, right? See what works, maybe a good area, then they start a development. Maybe they have multiple stack benches. They have to figure out those benches, similar to what's going on in the Delaware now. Are you getting interference vertically or horizontally? What's the right optimal development spacing to to you know, get a, the best return on your investment or whatever you're trying to achieve financially. Um, the powder, because it's limited to number of players that are really investing uh, a sizable amount of money annually, uh, it's been going at a much slower pace. If you looked at the charts, you'd say it's it's not just go- growing as fast as these others. So I think you know the powder really is at the point where. Um, we need to understand, and we're—I think we're—we're we're, we're working on this piece um, to understand what is the optimal development for Niobrara, and then eventually Maori or some of the other targets. I think we have an idea on the tight sandstones, given the amount of targeting and drilling that was done on those early on, some of the spacing tests that were accomplished over the past year or two. Niobrara is still in that phase where, what is the spacing? Is it four wells, six wells, eight wells per DSU? Um, how big are the fracks? You know how do you how do you optimize and, and maximize your return on that investment for those for those wells and when you get that rolling then i think you really see the the basin start to take off you may see, see some additional transactions some consolidation of a lot of the private equity and a lot of the private companies that don't have the access to capital to develop their assets correctly or timely uh, and then someone who has that capital and wants to put that investment to work they can acquire that if the if the, if the deal structure is right and, and go forward. And I think that will take the basin then to that next level. And I think the Maori and some some deeper targets, there's actually some deeper targets that will come along as part of that next wave is, is my opinion. And so, and the Niobrara right now, that that's the gem. How, what, what percentage of wells from all the operators, yourselves included, would you say in 2020 is being focused on unlocking the Niobrara in particular to really bring the play to that, that next level, the decision where, you know, guys want to, just blow and go yeah i think what we're starting to see again the publics you know we all know they're they're coming out with their q4 calls here shortly and a lot of them are setting their plans for 20 once their boards approve it first part of the year Uh, but what i've been hearing is that you know the publics chesapeake you're you're going to see them drill more more niobrara less turners devon i believe is about a 50 50 program ourselves we're roughly 50 50 about well, I say that half Turner, half Nile, and then some scattered handful of Maori and and, and muddy wells. Uh, EOG, I have not heard, um, but you know they're they, they're very good at sharing data. They is are. What I've, is what I've yeah. learned over my career. <laughs> yes. So I don't. I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do, but yeah. you know the last through 19, they drilled, they drilled Turner, Parkman, Maori, Nile. They're still not, from what I can see, they're still not in full scale development mode. They're still drilling you know, a DSU or two off a pad, and then they may move a township or two away, do something else. Uh, what I hear on the street is that they're they're trying to get all their DSUs lined up, get their development rows with the corridors for their pipelines and everything else, and they're gonna start mowing down DSUs. Now, it's not in, I haven't seen them do that yet, but they, I'm hearing I'm hearing that's what they're they're trying to tee up to get to get rolling to do. So so let's let's talk about you for a little bit, um, which I'm sure will be really fun. Um, when you made the decision to come to Anschutz, what what was a driver for that, and what's what's your background in terms of you know uh, historical career work, and and what have you found working at a private company that's different or the same as as you've had before? Yeah. So so. 
just for background, I'm a geologist, so worked exploration for many years with, with Oxy. So I started out of school, I got my master's at Texas A&M, and started out of school with Oxy in Jackson, Mississippi, doing some development geology, some exploration geology, and really focused on the, on the U.S. for a number of years. Um, and then ended up overseas down in Bogota, Colombia for four years and was the chief geologist down there and started doing more in Colombia. And then I started doing South America. And then I moved back to the United States and I was the exploration manager for Oxy for their Libya when they re-entered Libya, when Libya opened back up again. Um, and, you know, really, I don't want to call it frontier because it wasn't at the time, but a lot of big big exploration spent a lot of money shooting seismic drilling big wells that type of stuff offshore and onshore very exciting um but you know get to put up with a lot of unsuccessful efforts because uh, that's right. exploration um but eventually at oxy um i ended up in business development and so um did some stuff in um, south america and southern hemisphere um, actually ended up leading a team at oxy that was focused on unconventionals and this was back in 2006 really before unconventionals really took off before the eagle Ford really before eog had locked up the whole eagle Ford, we were we were kind of kicking around where we want to go um, and it was interesting because i went back a couple of years ago and looked at what the what the analysis of the team came up with and they, they identified three plays that we should get into the bakken the marcellus and the eagle Ford. And you know we were too late on all those because we weren't aggressive enough. Uh, we ended up doing some deals to buy in, you know, to the Balkan as as you're aware and those type of things. Um, so I ended up um, general manager of Oxy's Williston position, and had a you know 100 plus person team drilling multiple wells in the Balkan and and really getting getting a good learning on operations around horizontal wells and and you know today's practices in the industry. Um, and then I had an outside opportunity to come up with Sanchez Energy, and it was after the IPO. So Sanchez, you know, really was a conventional South Texas exploration company, Gulf Coast, really. Um, and they had had a good position, in, or a small position, but good in the Eagleford. And they IPO went public in that big wave when a lot of companies were IPO mm -hmm. in the oil and gas space. Um, and went there and helped them for a year, really transition from a private family-owned company to a, to a public um, but I knew the Anschutz, um, I, knew, I knew Mr. Anschutz and a number of, of, of key individuals here at Anschutz. Uh, they were looking to make a change. Some of the um, folks who were, who, who were the leads and the vice presidents here were looking to retire and they were looking to change from, the company had been, we used to call it Big E, Big Exploration, looking for the big things um, you know, in, in North America. They were looking to change, focus more on uh, lower 48 and so um, the opportunity was ideal for me get out of the public company Sarbanes Oxley and yeah. <laughs> all these other things and and go to a, a private a private entity that had export you know was willing to take some risk new exploration uh, understood exploration and had capital and one owner those type of things so that the opportunity was just a, a, a ideal chance for me to, to make a move and get to D in Denver on top of it all. Do you think that, you know, we saw the Hill Corp acquisition of BP's old Alaskan assets and obviously 500,000 acres in the powder and really cored up there. Do you see uh, a wave of a lot more billionaire owners, I guess, uh, owning a massive position and, and really turning into a, a private play? And, and if if so, what are, what are the what are the challenges that you see around acquiring these positions? You know, obviously you had a whole bunch of exploration historically. You identified the play, but but with where the U.S. is now, and so I would say all the rock that's worth owning is already owned. If I don't know, let me ask you: Do you agree? Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? I mean, as an explorationist, as a geologist, what do you what do you think about that concept? So well, there's two things there. One, you asked about billionaires, and two is exploration. So no, no. Well, so so the, the, billion, the billionaire. Well, I, I actually the, the billionaire question was. I mean, historically, the, Mr. Andrews has been an explorer, that's and correct. you've pivoted. Yep. And so, if there's rock worth owning that's worth exploring, is that where you see 
you know, private companies focusing on? Or do you think that you would see more like a Hill Corp, which is buying older assets like in Alaska and turning it into sort of a yield vehicle? So I guess they're sort of related. If you believe there's exploration to be done, do you see private companies doing it? And then secondarily, do you see a wave of private capital, big private capital, billionaire companies, just large pools moving in in a bigger way into energy right now? Yeah, uh, let's. Yeah, the first one really around exploration. So, having haven't been involved with exploration for decades, right? Um, a lot of the companies that I know, the public companies in the lower forty-eight, don't do exploration anymore. And I worked at Oxy for many years, and some at Sanchez, right? They they got away from it. They may claim to do some exploration, but they don't do traditional ex exploration. It's near field. It's in blocks they already own, in basins they operate, right? That type of stuff. It's not, it's not new ventures. It's not looking for a new play, new basins outside of where they're already operating. Uh, there are a handful. We've we we've, we've encountered them. Um, publics that 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 do that. Um, there's probably you know one that's, I think, but my opinion ranks near the top of what they do. Um, but there's not a lot. And so I think really it comes back to what we've seen in the industry before, the private individuals, private companies who are willing to take that risk, understand that, get in early, get things cheap, identify it. If it doesn't work, you have a loss, but it's not a, it's not a large loss that you can't overcome. And, and you do that. And we, we that's, that's really where we feel our strength is from Anschutz. Uh, we still do that. Again, we have a, we're a very strong uh, subsurface team. Um, and we've identified additional areas we like. Uh, we're currently, you know, building up those positions slowly. We're not in a rush because of the way the market is. And we have our hands full with the powder right now with our 500,000 acres in, in, in that basin. Uh, but we do have a small group that's on the cutting, I don't want to call them cutting edge, but they're doing the traditional new ventures, exploration work, looking for new plays in the lower 48. And we actually had some meetings late last year. We had some ideas, which I thought were pretty fascinating. Uh, so we're going to continue to do that. Uh, those have really long term time frame, we're at five or 10 years, probably. By the time we identify them, work them, buy the acreage, test them, get permits, right? I mean, the whole thing. And do they work? Then do you have to do a spacing test? I mean, there's all these things you put all together. It's it's a, it's a decade. Uh, but we, so we have some long term. And I think I think a lot of the public's in my opinion, from a financial perspective, don't want to invest in something that's 10 years. That money needs to be spent today on something that's going to generate revenue tomorrow. They don't have that vision. So the privates or the private equity doesn't have that time frame. It's individuals or, or, or people with you know, the, the, the long-term outlook, uh, and we're one of them, luckily, to do that. Um, but that's, if it works, that's where you get a, a, a you realize a nice a nice uptick in your investment. So, so. I mean, it, it kind of sets the stage, actually, uh, exactly what you said. You can have a 10 year time horizon and you're doing exploration, whereas you would not hear any public company doing that because they're thinking quarter to quarter. Do you think that you would see a range of recapitalizations where public companies, you know, there's probably no benefit. I think Harold Hamm has said that recently. There's no benefit in being a public company because you don't have access to capital. Mm -hmm. Could you see a lot of these companies may be going private long term to, to kind of go back to the roots of oil and gas with li literally big E, a portfolio, a longer term horizon. Is that is that somewhere that you could see uh, big pools of capital moving as, as the industry faces the challenges we face today? Well, I think it kind of goes back to your comment or question about about billionaires. I mean, whether Jerry Jones or, or you know, right. I mean, some of these guys are. are Looking at that, I think they're, they look at it as a long, good, long-term investment. And I don't, I don't know Jerry Jones, but I'm assuming that's what he's doing, putting a billion dollars or whatever he put in, right? Hill Corp, um, and there's others um, out there, right? You know, not just U.S. billionaire money, but private money that's coming into the yeah, space. Like, like Chris Callan last week with, exactly. with Callan Ventures, absolutely, right, right. And they're looking at long-term, maybe a yield-type vehicle, um, a lot of PDP, some PUDs go in there, develop it. It's not the same thing that Anschutz is doing where we're looking for something that has no yield and no return until maybe we get a monetization event. It's a different different piece of the spectrum. Uh, but I think there's definitely the, it seems to be the market, but the market always seems to change, but the market's definitely going that way today. 
Now, whether the public investors will come back to oil and gas space at some point, um, that to be determined, right? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of uh, challenges right now. You know, all the climate change um, commentary, um, the, the the lack of return on the investments in the in the shale space, which we all hear about about the billions of lo- quote. And I put it lost dollars. I look at it as investment dollars. But right. Some people understand lost money. They made investments in companies that have gone bankrupt, or you know, the bonds have been destroyed or crushed right? yeah. yeah exactly right so but that had to be done to get us the industry to get the industry to where it is today the u.s is producing 13 was it 13 million barrels a day yeah, pretty close you know uh, and oil's cheap so so, <laughs> so as as a private company i mean how, how do you think through esg i, I think uh, we were talking about it at lunch glenn and i were uh around Almost if you don't have an ESG slide in your slide deck for a public investor, if it's not like slide one or two, investors are upset. Whereas to your point, billions have been invested slash destroyed and we, we as an industry haven't really made money. As a private company, how do you think through the ESG that you you implement, um, the, the way you, you see facing the challenges of climate change if you, you used it out there how do you address it and, and what do you think of of that for a private company like yourself i think it goes back to, to me this is a personal view is that it goes back to the basics we're making an investment to to drill a well or produce or you know buy acreage whatever we want to do well i don't want to waste that investment right if i can not lose any gas because there's a leak or i can do, build a smaller pad or doing a more efficient pipeline to get the oil or gas to market and get it sooner, that's what we should do from an investment standpoint. And that becomes more sustainable because it's, that's the right decision. It's right. not, we're not doing it just because it's, sorry, it's the, the cool thing today to say we have an ESG program or you know, whatever, right? right. Um, it's, it's really about good business decisions. Um, in, our, in our position of the powder, one of the things that, that, I think is misunderstood about the powder is people look at it and say, well, it's early in the development phase. You know, the basin's, I don't know, it's in Canada. For some people, it's so far away. But the basin's been through, again, a couple of development phases already. There's existing pipelines. Our current production out of the basin, we actually only have two wells, well, actually three now, three wells out of our whole operated position that are not hooked up to oil and gas pipelines. And then oil and gas. I mean, we're trucking almost nothing. And in fact, trucking is for our oil is a tiny little piece, right? Because we got a couple single wells that we're testing some stuff on. But in our main area, actually, we're get we're currently uh, in the in the midst of fracking a, a dozen wells right now. Every single one of them has oil and gas pipelines already to the pads, ready to hook up with meters, everything else. So it's again, it's it's sustainable in that we're not gonna be trucking or spilling or creating dust or, or, you know, putting water on the roads to keep them dry or flaring gas for some period of right. time. It's, it's going down the pipeline as efficient as we can get it. Cause right. we look at you it. Don't, you don't need a, a, an explicit ESG slide because you're just doing the right business decision. Exactly. That's, that's how I try to simplify it. Look at it. Now we are, we are, we are doing some things We're we're in the process of acquiring an infrared camera. Um, we want, again, we want to be, um, you know, good shepherds, uh, and and make sure we do the right things. Um, but that's a good investment for us as well, right? If we if we have an infrared camera, we see some leaks, we fix them. We weren't aware of them. Well, we're getting more value out of that, right? We'll get a return on that investment to buy that camera. Um, so those yeah. are the, those are the things we're doing. But we're not. We don't have a. We don't have a large staff. We don't have a lot of people to do that. But it, it makes sense just to. To watch where we, where we invest and what right. we do. If you look back over the last six years in the powder, any any uh, mistakes are obviously hard to say. Well, that was a mistake because everything is a learning process. But any real surprises that came out as you were moving through the development? Anything that just was really shocking that they just would never have expected, or, or any any maybe mistakes is the right word that, that yeah. come to mind. I don't. Know, I like you. Don't like to call them mistakes. They're they're learnings. So I'll tell you one funny story. So the the very first horizontal well we drilled in the powder at the start of this program, which was, I think, 2015, if I think about it now, was a Parkman well uh, in Campbell County. 
and we thought the trend just extended from again that's when a lot of the park was being developed by devon and eog those type of things ballard uh, so we stepped out uh, a little ways a couple of townships uh, drilled a long lateral didn't make didn't make a, an ounce of hydrocarbon it's a complete water well our very first horizontal well yeah. How, how was that meeting when you when you got to do <laughs> the uh, the meeting with Mr. Andrews on that one? It wasn't as pleasant as as I hoped. <laughs> uh, so we you know made the joke that we spilled more oil on the pad uh, you know from someone's you know vehicle leak you know dripping a few oil drops and we found that well. Uh, so that was not not an ideal start start to a, to a program, uh, but we've obviously improved since then. Uh, we you know like you said everything's a learning. I don't know. We did mistakes. We've done, you know, spacing tests that maybe we shouldn't have drilled 12. Some people said, oh, you should have drilled four. I don't know if you would have learned from four, right? Right. Uh, it's not a mistake. We're still get, uh, you know, we're still getting the bulk of our, our, our investment back. We're not making a good return on it, but we'll get our money back. It's not a complete loss like that first parkman well. How, how is the water infrastructure in, in Wyoming broadly and in, in the core part of the Powder River Basin? I know a lot of the, the, Delaware in particular has very, very high water oil ratios. And so water management is really key. You talked about that your gas and, and oil are hooked up, but you didn't mention water, which makes me think that, that there must not be a lot of water. The, well, first off, you're correct. The formations don't produce as much water as the Delaware, from my understanding, and I have not looked at the Delaware in detail. So I'm here a little bit of here, kind of, here say, know, yeah. 80 percent water would be in the sort of average well in the bulk of the Delaware, if not higher. OK, well, ours is 25 to 30 percent. OK, so substantially less. Uh, we do. And I will tell you, we still we, we drilled the Maori well last year. For some reason, early on, it was making 80 percent water. It's dropped considerably since then. Um, but a lot of our Turner wells, I mean, they're actually 20 percent or less. NIOs are similar, and in, 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 in I'm talking about our well specifically. I'm not talking about broadly in the basin. There are areas that make a little more water, a little bit less. Um, but water, produced water is not too great. Um, we have plenty of water for completions. Uh, we, we, in an area where we know we're going to drill multiple wells with our surface use agreements and with the, with the landowners, we drill our own water wells. We'll build some uh, retention ponds. And then we'll fast line the water to the wells for our initial completions. We currently have in our in our most mature asset in Commerce County, we currently have a draft plan to build out water infrastructure for reuse. Um, to, we've actually bought 640 acres of surface ourselves, and we're going to build our own couple million barrel um, ponds to recycle and reuse produce water for full field development again we're not quite at full field development because we don't we haven't decided exactly what the ideal spacing is in Niobrara but then we can go in and co-develop Niobrara, Turner, Parkman have this water reuse and really see and the other thing we're looking forward to you make that initial capital investment uh, the cost savings on all those subsequent wells uh, pays that initial investment back in six months or nine months it's very short actually given a you know projected well count um, and then after that it's it's obviously additional cost savings going forward so you you mentioned a 12 well test was that uh, talk to me about that in terms of the stacked zones and 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 how you're thinking through pad development you said you're still not quite there are most of your wells multi-well pads or are you still where, where are you at on that development and, and the 12 well pad what was that yeah so we we actually um, what we did was end up drilling 12 Turner wells across three DSUs and we drilled uh, two wells per pad um, because of the way we had to space them with the landowner um, regulations or rules, so to speak. Um, but what we're doing today, um, uh, most of our wells, I would say probably 60, 70 percent, the majority are multi-well pads. Uh, we may drill two. In some cases, we have some wells coming up later this year. There'll be um, five wells off a pad, um, but we still have some singles where we're, we're pra I call it appraising because we know the oil's there, right? We know the formation's there. It's just what, what rate is it going to do? Um, so we have some appraisals that are still single wells. Um, and so it's a, it's a mix. But again, probably off the top of my head, 67% are multi-well pads. 
that we currently have on our schedule. And and what from the data that's out there, you know, the private data or, or new data, what's what's the most exciting thing that you've seen come out of either your own operations or other operations that's that's making you feel like the nut is cracked and that and that you'll be able to move quicker or slower to development uh, mode. Yeah, the thing that we're we're really seeing and, the, and one of the things we're really been focused on f- really for the last coming up on twelve months is uh, the Nibrera and the results out of the Nibrera, both ge- geographically diverse distribution of, of these results, and then and then some of the spacing tests that ourselves and others are doing. Uh, the data that we have from our 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 essentially all our Nibrera wells, uh, and we currently have I think nine plus. Um, and then from the offset operators is we're seeing a fairly narrow distribution on the productivity from those wells. So from your P90 to P10, it's not like this huge spread of results. The results are actually fairly tight. I think I can't remember the exact numbers, like a 2x or something. It's not very, the variable variability is not great. So you're seeing this, what I view as extremely valuable results that say statistically, we know with a very limited band of distribution what we're going to get out of these. And so then it becomes, if this is the band that you're going to get, then where can you get your cost to? You know your result, what your cost numbers need to be. And the results, I'll tell you, are, are we're seeing wells, our initial Nile wells are anywhere from 900,000 to 1.2 million barrels EUR forecast, and they're 80 plus percent oil. They're not gas wells. And again, the water content is 25, 30%, so you're not handling a lot of water. So there's a lot of a lot of um, items which really, I think, go to the powder being economically uh, very high value. And that'd be like a 10,000 foot lateral, yeah. kind of in that yeah. range? Yeah, 9,500 feet is what, what our targets are. And uh, what will capital for a Nibrera well right now? Again, development would obviously be cheaper, but what you sort of expect for 2020 capital for a 10,000 foot Nibrera? Yep, so we've been working on that actually the last couple of months as we put our 2020 program together. So uh, middle of last year, we drilled a three well Nibrera pad to test uh, seven well spacing. Uh, our first well, I think was like 10, don't quote me on this, but 10.5, uh, the next well was 10.2, and the last well we did on that pad, we did for like 9.2 million. And this is drilled 9,500 feet, completed multiple stages, and it's still, a, in my opinion, it's still too large of a frack, but a, a sizable frack, mm-hmm. and facilities. And they're a shared facility. Those three wells are now shared. A facility would save us some money. So we were down, we're down, you know, low nines, actuals today. And then our forecast, we, we went back out at the end of the year, and we're still it's still ongoing, but we rebid all all of our major services, you know, our high value, high spend areas first, and we're working our way down that chain for materials and suppliers. Uh, we saw um, not only did we see, but our, our our team negotiated extremely favorable uh, contracts for us, um, and so we're seeing a million dollars in savings just off a of new contracting for materials and services. So we think our target for Nyabreras should be eight to eight and a half for 20, and that's what we have in our budget. Wow. And our Turner wells, just to back up a little bit on those, so our 12 well tests that we, spacing tests that we did, those averaged 8.4 million. And this was the end of 17 and 18, and we had a lot of winter issues and things that cost us more at that time when we did that. Right now, we'd actually just finished up two Turner wells because we have this big 12 wells we're currently fracking right now. Uh, those wells right now should be about 7.2 uh, million today. And we think going further into the year, we'll be under $7 million for Turners. Wow. So the cost uh, for Nybrer and Turner in development mode, we think is gonna, again, all, all, the, all the points to the powder, they're gonna be substantially less than a lot of plays for, you know, 800, 900 million barrel type of tank yeah. curves. Yeah. I mean, with I mean, with that, the oil content. I mean, based on exactly what you said, I mean, that's 10, 15% cost savings on wells with where they are. I mean, that does sound like we could be seeing in 2020, uh, you know, arguably a big ramp up as, as maybe some tier one inventory in other basins like the Bach and like the Eagleford has kind of dwindled. Mm-hmm. And you have guys like EOG that could redeploy. So that'd be something to watch. 
And I think that I think that's coming. And again, I think going back to the comments we made on EOG or talked about earlier, is that EOG is putting a, a plan to get together. We understand, you know, water handling, uh, surface use, infrastructure pipelines, corridors, lining up all their DSUs in nice rows. I think you're going to see them, and I don't know when, because uh, you know they have a lot of inventory across their whole their whole company, a lot of different places to deploy capital. But I think at some point you'll see them. I think really put multiple rigs to work in the powder. So it's it's kind of a weird place to, to potentially end an interview, but you're one of the few companies I've heard talk about ceramics. And I remember, you know, early Bakken days, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. low prop and loading ceramic. And, you know, I've certainly been of the view that like a three, 400 pound per foot ceramic frack in the Bakken in 2009 is kind of equivalent to like, a, I don't know, a thousand pound per foot white mm -hmm. sand where you have crushing. Um, how do you think through ceramic as one of the few companies actually running it in terms of the, the cost benefit, where where it is today versus where it was 10 years, its use go forward? And, and do you think industries maybe miss something in some of the cost reductions that's making us drill more wells per spacing unit because we're using lower quality sand? How do you how do you assess the, the viability of ceramic as a, as a technology, technology solution for downspacing? Yeah, we hadn't thought about it so much for downspacing, but so it goes back to our my my VP of Ops, our VP of Ops here um, was the completion manager in the Balkan for Anschutz, and some of the early or essentially the, the earliest slick and ceramic jobs in the Balkan were driven by Anschutz. Uh, again, I think it goes back to private companies, Anschutz in particular, um, having the ability and wherewithal to try new things, take some risk. Um, you know, it's not like, okay, if one well doesn't quite work, you know, our quarter is not blown. We didn't miss our target because the one well, which we were expecting 2,000 barrels a day, only made 200, right? Uh, we, can, we can survive that at Anschutz being private where I think the public's can't. So it gives us the ability to do some of those things first off. What we've done, again, just to eliminate as many variables to understand whether a play or a target is economic or what the results is get out of it, we, we use ceramic early on, and then we make the, the switch. And equivalent basis, like you just explained, if we pump 400, 500, 600 pounds of ceramic, well, then we need six, 800, 1,000, 1,200 pounds of, of white and whatever size to, to make that equivalent um, change. Um, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've actually, again, been trying to, I say this, we're trying to I shouldn't say scale back. We're trying to optimize our completions for our spacing for the given formation. Turner formation, very, uh, you know, a tight sand, very favorable. It's almost almost a conventional. We've run lateral logs in some of the horizontals we've drilled, and we've seen 12, 15, 16% porosity in small zones in the Turner. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's, that's a conventional reservoir. Right. You don't need to put no. 1,000 or 1,200 pounds of, of any type of prop, you're wasting your money. You're just throwing dollars away. So we, some of our latest jobs are in that 400 pounds, four, four to 600 pounds of sand in the term. Uh, so they're, they're small. A lot of people are going to say, Andrew is now pumping tiny jobs. Right. Well, we'll see the results in the economic. I mean, really, it comes down to it's not an EOR. It's not an IP. It's what did you invest? What did you get back out of it? It's a business decision on on. On, on your return on your investment. And it helps when it's one person writing the check and then they see what's going in their account to kind of have a look back. That's very different, isn't it? And, and they do look back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trust me. Yeah. I, mean, I, I get a call and said, okay, what'd you spend on that? And then tell me how much revenue we're making off it. It really it comes down to that. Yeah. It, it, but it gets you focused on that's your decision. And the big publics, I don't, you know, I've worked this on, you don't see that. Mm -hmm. It's rolled up in quarters. It's, it, you know, people focused on one thing or another thing. Um, and it's not it's not pushed down to the wellhead. The old saying, closer to the wellhead, better decisions, right? Um, those type right. of things. And it's day to day, are people engaged in you know what we're trying to achieve? So you're running a business trying to make money. That is that is a, cutting I mean, edge. You huh? heard it here first. <laughs> cutting edge. Uh, this this one it. this one I, I think we touched on a little bit, but but it was sort of around the levers that a private company can pull. Um, and you you certainly talked about ESG is is a business practice. Uh, you talked about uh, have. Are there any other levers that being private, long duration that you didn't talk about that you think really makes a big difference to the model? So two things that that we talk about here internally. Um, first off, we can keep our name, and we largely do. We kind of keep our name 
out of the news or just out of the public view, right? We buy leases with other brokers, X, Y, Z. Um, we can't keep it completely quiet, but we don't we don't need the publicity. I'm doing this because yeah. I know you guys, and yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's interesting. Um, and then you know the other thing I think is that we can make or I know we make extreme we're extremely flat organization and we can make decisions almost instantaneously and they're not they're not tiny decisions I mean tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollar decisions we can make in less than an hour right um, and and deals for trades or deals to join wells or trade interest or XYZ it's amazing that we can not amazing i shouldn't say that we we make a decision usually in a day or two after we get our technical work done and we've negotiated with some publics and i will tell you this it's taken us nine to 12 months to get a deal out of them nine to 12. yeah and it's it's just it's insane the length of time difference between those two they can do that they just are not structured to to do that and i it, it hurts them but that that's our benefit so if we see something and you're familiar like you said you you know us back in you know 15 and mm -hmm. 14 um we some of our initial entry into the powder we weren't the top bidder but we were the first mover and we had we had the ability to close we had cash we didn't have to write on funding or a board approval anything we did deals because we were hand shoots so there's there are some distinct advantages to our our structure and how, how we're set up. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So that that kind of brings our conversation with Joe to Dominic to a close. As always, you can find it on the web at www.hottakeoftheday.com. You can find all our archive posts, all our archive blogs. Anytime you have a question that you want us to ask uh, one of our guests or ask me, you can reach me at drw at hottakeoftheday.com. And until next time, be good, be safe, have a great day. Bye for now.